It's uh, truly a pleasure to be back here. And every time I come back, uh, this campus changes and changes for the good. We had some wonderful meetings over at the School of uh, Social Work, and I think we have some wonderful partnerships that uh, are going to grow and, and move, and I hope we can do many more things. Uh, I know we helped uh, Dave Hollenbeck do some things on refugees and migrants, and uh, it's our wish that we can further uh, expand this relationship with uh, BC and, and many other Catholic universities, uh, offering to you all the opportunities that we experience in those hundred countries around the world. Uh, we have a special optic on what's happening in the world. In all the places you read, I don't know whether the globe is still surviving, but at least if you read the New York Times, going from page three onward, from the Darfurs to the Zimbabwe's to the Hades, and that's our world. Tonight, uh, you've given me with this lofty theme an opportunity to tell our story. And I'm going to try to tell our story and occasionally show a picture. But walking and chewing gum is not always easy for me, so uh, please excuse. Uh, I want to tell you how we have come to a deeper, more profound understanding of who we are, the principles that underline our actions, and how we live out our Catholic identity. We're a large organization, a complex organization, there's a lot of moving parts in a lot of places where the gears get stuck. And to find our identity, our mission, our Catholic identity in all of that has, has been a challenge. Um, but I, we found most profoundly that our identity revolves around charity. Now, some of you may be cringing a little bit. But it fi we find our identity in charity in the most profound sense. And we find that identity in the derivative meanings of justice and solidarity as well. And I, I'm not using derivative in the Wall Street sense. But first of all, uh, Catholic Relief Services and what we do. Um, most of you who are here tonight um, know us in some way. Um, maybe you're wise enough to contribute, maybe you've Googled our website, um, maybe you've, you've encountered us in some way. And so I presume most of you are not mixing Catholic Relief Services up with Catholic Charities. We are two distinct organizations in the church. We collaborate wherever we can. But so many people, the people I'll be playing golf with and they'll say, who do you work for? I say, Catholic Relief Services. My sister-in-law works for Catholic Charities. I mean, we're always, always mixed up with them. They're a great agency. In fact, I think uh, if we tried to describe who we are, uh, I found that we were about the same size as Boston College, about $700 million. We're owned by the U.S. Co Conference of Catholic uh, Bishops. They started us, as, as was mentioned in 43. We're governed interestingly, by a board of bishops, lay people, and religious. And that only happened six years ago when we brought lay people and non-bishops onto the board, and it has created a new dynamism for the organization. We also happen to be one of the larger American humanitarian organizations. We're founded in 43, that was about the same time that the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, Lutheran World Relief, the American Friends Service Committee, all found their early beginnings during the Second World War. And uh, e even in those days, we had a different name. We were called War Relief Services. From our beginnings in Europe, we expanded into Europe and Latin America, Asia. Uh, we broadened our mandate to serving the poor around the world. And as was mentioned today, we are in over 100 countries with about 5,000 employees working on the edge. We're probably best known from those early days for our response to high-profile emergencies because that's what the media wants to cover about us. But we have been there in all of those countries working on long-term solutions long after the network cameras leave the scene. Day in and day out, in addition to the emergency response, our bread and butter 
is the address to the tragic situations of grinding poverty that all too often are not placed in the limelight. We help families and communities develop their own resources, the ones they need to sustain them over the long term. The goal is to help them become self-sufficient. We work with and for the world's poorest, the globe's most traumatized people, those stricken by disease, ravaged by war, brutalized by madmen, exploited by oppressors, and left by the uncaring. Two weeks ago, I had the Archbishop of Gulu, Uganda, in my office. And he told the story of meeting with Joseph Cooney, the head of the Lord's Resistance Army. If there is any evil in the world, it is found in Joseph Cooney. He has done terrible things to children, taking them as slaves and, and causing all kinds of problems. And this courageous archbishop went to see Joseph Cooney to see if he could bring about peace. That's the environment the Catholic Relief Services works in. Our development efforts involve programming in agriculture, community health, education, peace building, microfinance, sanitation, and increasingly, and particularly over the last 10 years, an address to the two epidemics, HIV and AIDS and malaria, two things that are scourges in our world. Here in the U.S., as was mentioned, we try to offer education programs to Catholic dioceses, parishes, universities, and to individuals to help them understand that international reality of poverty and crisis and disease. We discuss the cures and the causes, and we strive wherever we can to try to educate the American Catholic community about their moral responsibility, our moral responsibility, to reach out in love and concern for our fellow beings around the world. We do this by promoting awareness of social justice issues. We do this with a profound understanding that inequality and injustice are at the root causes of poverty. And CRS understands its mission as a relief and development agency to include the promotion of global solidarity, the promotion of social justice, wherever we can. We do this by raising our voice in Washington, on Capitol Hill, in the corridors of the White House, any place we can. We do this by helping to mobilize a grassroots effort that will bring pressure on public policy to focus on the concerns of the poorest. Let me give you a little sense of our development as a Catholic agency, and I like to look at this, through the develop, this development through three phases in our history. In each phase, we looked at our work and our identity as a humanitarian organization through three different perspectives, or three different lenses. Let me start with the early part of our history, where we viewed our mission through the perspective or the lens of social welfare. This was in the 40s and 50s, and CRS understood its mission as performing what the Catholic Catechism calls the corporal works of mercy. Nothing wrong with that. Our goal was to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, and so forth. And as I mentioned, we were founded in response to those darkest days of World War II. We were first involved in help, helping to resettle refugees and providing emergency assistance to people displaced by the horrors of war in Europe. So in the beginning, we were essentially an emergency and refu refugee resettlement agency. And I'll just uh, segue a little bit into uh, last year I was out at Notre Dame for the commencement ceremonies and um, one of the guests uh, and someone who was going to receive the, an award at Notre Dame was the president of Lithuania. And President Jenkins of Notre Dame introduced me to him as Catholic Relief Services. His jaw dropped. He couldn't get any words out of his mouth. And he said, you brought me to the United States. You brought my parents to the United States. You settled us in Chicago. 
he had become kind of a bigwig in the Environmental Protection Agency in Chicago. And then after 20 years with EPA, he stood for election and won in Lithuania. He calls his wife over and in Lithuania and he says, yes, Catholic Relief Services. She gives me a big kiss. And I'm finding more and more that there are those people of that generation that now are in coming close to retirement that we had a small hand in bringing to this country and they contributed great things to this country. In the early part of our history, we viewed our mission through, as I said, that, that perspective of social welfare. And we understood our, our mission as performing those things, as I said, uh, the corporal works of mercy. Um, but as we perform the corporal works of mercy, we, Catholic Relief Services staff, were the determinants of who got the mercy, who was fed, who was given clean water, who was closed. We acted on our impulse to do good. In those years, we were very much affected by the United States post-war policies. That included the Truman Doctrine and other efforts to advance the American agenda for democracy and economic development in Europe and around the world. And to a certain extent, the attitude behind American foreign assistance in that era was paternalistic. We had the answers. It suggested that we knew best. And those of you who are students of modern American history know that this was, in the 50s, a halcyon period of American triumphalism. The resources provided by the American Catholic community and by the U.S. government together were basically relief assistance. But we did something else during that period, and I'm, as you can tell, a little bit critical of that period, although that was the times. Those were the times. We did something else that was lasting and important. We helped start within the local Catholic Church in every country that we worked an agency, a capacity, which oftentimes bore the title Caritas, that was the expression of the concern of the Catholic Church in that country. Most of those organizations exist today. They are part of a network of 157, 167 Caritas agencies that come together in Rome under the umbrella of something called Caritas Internationalis. It is one of, if not the largest human service social justice capacities in the world when you put the whole thing together. Beginning in the late 60s and continuing to the 80s, we changed. Another phase came about. We entered this second phase when we experienced the evolution to socioeconomic development. And a much more efficient, we were concerned about efficiency at the, in those days. That evolution uh, of, the, of the church's social mission through development followed and flowed out of the Second Vatican Council. It came from the document Gaudium et Spes in its famous opening line, the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of men of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted. These are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. CRS was also guided during that period by Pope Paul VI's influential 1967 encyclical Populorum Progresso on the development of people in which he wrote those, that memorable line that's become somewhat of a motto for us. Development is the new name for peace. And through this process, we came to broaden the mission from primarily one of providing assistance, where we determine what the assistance needs were, to one of empowering people and working on sustainable solutions. CRS came to work its, to view its work from what we called a development lens. From this point, we didn't just address poverty through relief and charitable activities, we also focused on eliminating the immediate causes of poverty through long-term programs. It was like the old saying, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach him to fish and feed him for a lifetime. We applied that philosophy to programs that improved health, 
We increased agricultural production among communities that we associated with. All of these programs were state of the art in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, using the latest and best knowledge and technology available to us. It was the period of the social development lens, and it continued right up into the 90s. But more world events caused CRS to shift its vision from looking at a mission through a lens of social development to one of social justice. And that was the third and current phase of our history. One of um, my last assignments um, before taking over the CRS uh, executive job was running our operations in war-torn Somalia in the 90s. I witnessed the complete breakdown of the social and political structures in that country. I watched random violence. I saw the vulnerability of the poorest of the poor. And it was total anarchy, total anarchy. We often had great plans, but were never able to implement them in those days. But when I think back on it, perhaps the greatest good we did in, those, in that situation and some other situations like it over the years was simply being there, being present, being with people as they suffered. We tried to do what we could, but we couldn't always do something. Except in our presence, we offered some element of hope. I also learned in that period about the difficulties in, and, and complexities of trying to foster right relationships in society. And I'll give you an, an example from Somalia in those days. There was a famine and there was a war. We tried to focus on feeding people and then improving their water supplies because it meant life for them and their animals. And to a Somali, if your animals are not alive, there's hardly any worth in being alive. So we had a program for digging out cleaning wells that existed in, and drilling deep ones. And we set about it with, with great efficiency uh, in a highly technical way with drill rigs and things like that only to learn a little later that the people who lived around those wells had stolen that land a generation before. And we were reinforcing people who had taken, excuse me, the land illegally. It was kind of a wake-up call, that instance and many like it, that you have to be much more sensible about intervening at any time. There's a lot of circumstances that happen in a, in a particular place in a country. Then about the same time with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we saw a spike around the world in ethnic conflicts. Not just behind the old Iron Curtain, um, but that was bad. In the Bosnian city of Sarajevo, the realities of ethnic cleansing shocked us into realizing that it was not just about relief that we should engage, but unless there was some kind of reconciliation among people, among Catholic Croats and Orthodox, Bosniaks and Jews and Gypsies, there would be no peace and any reconstruction efforts would be futile. And so we set about on a new course to bring elements of reconciliation deep into what we did. And at that time we opened offices in Croatia, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Serbia, Macedonia, Montenegro, places that we had left 30 years before. At the very same, same time, that is the early 90s, ethnic and civil unrest was breaking out in Africa. There was no Soviet Union to add glue to things. The tension of the Cold War was no longer there. And in the early 90s in Rwanda, there was a major uprising. It foreshadowed the ethnic violence of 1994. And at that time of reckoning, 1994, in about 100 days, Nearly 800,000 Rwandans 
mostly Tutsis and moderate Hutus, were slaughtered. That single event for Catholic Relief Services was a wake-up call. We had operated in that country since before independence in the 60s. We were known to every man, woman, and child in the country. We had fed virtually every child who went to school. They had participated in the maternal and child health program. We had built silos. We had agricultural programs. We were deeply engaged on a programmatic way. But more importantly, dozens of our staff were married to Rwandans, or their best friends were Rwandans, or had worked in the country. That slaughter, for all the evil it did, affected us as individuals in Catholic Relief Services in a very profound way. It triggered um, institutionally a crisis, an emotional crisis, a spiritual crisis, and an organizational crisis. And it caused us to reflect deeply on what we had been doing for the previous 50 years trying to be a good development agency, trying to be an efficient relief agency. We said, we were there in Rwanda. We knew the tension between Rwanda, uh, Hutus and Tutsis. That was palpable. It was always there, under the surface. But that was cultural or political. That had to do with relations in society. That had nothing to do with what we did, relief and development. And it was a whack in the side of the institutional head. And we took a year and focused. And we looked for a way to give us the vision forward. And we turned to um, someone many of you know here, uh, a friend of mine who, who became my counselor for a few years, Father Brian Hare. And he brought forward to us Catholic social teaching. In a very, those of you who know Brian Hare know that he does it in a way that is just um, so engaging. And it became a perfect framework for an organization like Catholic Relief Services. As a series of principles developed by church teaching over the last um, century, they were invaluable, spanning Pope Leo XIII, Rome Novarum, to the encyclicals of Benedict XVI, Deus Caritas Est, and Spe Salvi. The principles called people to live in solidarity. They placed the dignity and sanctity of the individual at the center of what we should be doing. They proclaimed a special option for the poor. They reminded us of our rights and responsibilities as members of society, of one human family. And they called on us to uphold the human, the common good. And more than that, for an agency that operates in a hundred countries with all kinds of different faith groups working with us, they spoke universal truths to all people, all people of goodwill. We were concerned that we would have to find an identity as a Catholic organization that was embracing. And Catholic social teaching made it possible and imperative that we embrace our human family. Since then, we examined everything we did through a lens of what we saw as a just society. It was how we evaluated our programs, our policies. It was how we related to the people we serve, how we related to the Catholic community here in the United States, how we related to one another as fellow employees. And it's how we attempted to build a culture of justice, peace, and reconciliation. The justice lens, as we call it, had a profound impact on our programming. We now evaluate not just whether our interventions are effective and sustainable, but whether they might have a negative 
impact on the economic and social fabric of a community. Helping one group in a community, even if its members are in dire need, might alienate others. So we had to look at the totality of the situation. Our staff had to determine what effect our programs might have on relations between different groups. Leaders and community members, men and women, rich and poor, governments and civil society, between different ethnicities and different faiths. And do that a priori as you try to shape the interventions, be they agricultural, microcredit, a disaster response. But don't do it in a way that is unconscious of that full reality. The justice lens also led us to get involved in some new initiatives, such as peace building. And we began to look for economic justice. We now look at issues such as the impact of extractive industries on a country. What's happening when the oil, the timber, the, the, the precious minerals are controlled by a small group? How is that promoting the common good? And what are we going to do about it? And what can we help our church partners do about it? We started advocating for fair trade so that people involved in the production of commodities like coffee and cacao for cocoa, for chocolate and handicrafts would receive just and fair compensation. We started talking about CAFTA and fair trade in the Americas. And some people said, that's not your business. And we said, it is our business to promote a just society for the poor. Let me give you a practical example how the justice lens changed our programming approach through the microfinance programs. We had been engaged in microfinance for decades. When I started uh, my career with CRS in Sierra Leone, we were doing, we didn't call it microfinance, but it was basically the same thing offering opportunities for groups, mostly of women, to get a loan, start a small business, pay back the loan, and then somebody else gets it. I mean, we've been doing it for a long time. And we try to measure payback rates, efficiencies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But as we looked at our microfinance programs with a justice lens, we said, is generating efficient income enough? That's what the whole microfinance uh, industry was focused on. How much income, how much savings, what are your payment rates, etc. And we concluded no, it wasn't enough. So in India, we started a new element off the microfinance programs, self-help lending, which engaged the beneficiaries much more. They determined how the program ran. Yes, they paid back their loans, but they did more than that. They spent more time together, and it was mostly women. Four years after we took this kind of a little detour in our microfinance programs, looking for more than just an efficient return on the dollar invested or dollar lent, we now have over 2,100 women who were part of those programs in India who have stood for political office. That was unthinkable before. But they felt empowered. They got the loan, they did something with it, they felt good, they had control over their lives, their husband didn't control all the money, and they felt so empowered as to stand for office. It was powerful. The reflection on Catholic social teaching led CRS in 2005 uh, and beyond to do many, many other new programming initiatives. But let me talk a little bit about the Catholic outlook of CRS. Um, how we think of ourselves, an organization of over 5,000 people around the world, most of who are non-Christian. In India we hire competent Hindus. In Egypt we hire competent Muslims. But we make no bones about who we are and the values and the beliefs that we have. And we have found that when you are clear with what you believe 
and you can stand up and talk about what you believe, people of all faiths are comfortable of associating with you. But then we had two particular ways of operating that kind of were developed out of our, our deeper sense of who we are as a Catholic agency and um, what Catholic social teaching said to us. The first flows directly out of Catholic social teaching and that is this holistic approach to helping people. Not allowing the microfinance program to just focus on the money. Not allowing the agronomist to just focus on agricultural production or the uh, physicians dealing with AIDS to just focus on therapy. But to look in the totality about how we intervene. And we developed an approach that we call integral human development. It makes us ask what assets, material, spiritual, does that person possess? How can we increase the capacity of those assets to withstand any of the shocks that that person in that family, in that community, are going to experience? And then design our intervention. And let me give you an example from the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami. You'll remember that, that time, well now almost four years ago, when um, the tsunami struck. We, we knew that our response in Sri Lanka, in Indonesia, in India, would involve providing shelter on a massive scale. That was obvious. And it turned out to be true. We also thought that we were going to face massive casualties. That wasn't the case. The waters either swept you away or they didn't. It was as simple as that. But the people who survived along the coast in Sri Lanka, along the coast of Banda Aceh and Aceh province, and on the eastern coast of India, were traumatized. They were in horrible shape. I mean, we encountered people just walking around the town in a daze. And here again, they needed emotional, spiritual assistance as well as assistance to rebuild their lives, their houses, their businesses, and everything else. And so as we framed our approach, it was in just that total way. Not enough to build homes effectively if the people in the homes were still traumatized. And then to help the caregivers, the priests, the nuns, the police, the medical staff in the hospitals, the government workers, understand the traumas that these people were going through. So that when somebody acted strange, when they stopped that guy walking around the town in a daze and put him in jail, that wasn't the proper intervention. We put all that together and I think our intervention was far more not only appropriate but effective than many others. The second way our Catholic outlook impacts on our work is related to the Catholic social teaching principle of subsidiarity. Catholic Relief Services is, has a large capacity, but we do not draw away from the partners we work with, church, non-church, and do for them what they can do for themselves. Partnership for us comes at the heart of our identity. It's the key to how we function. We collaborate first with a church groups, Catholic church groups, but so many others as well. And we always have to be sensitive to not stepping on their turf in ways that would marginalize them, but rather spend all our energy in building and helping them build their own capacity. They bring great expertise to 
whatever we attempt to do. Our reach around the world is enhanced because of the missionaries of charity, church partners, other non-governmental organizations. It is the way we work. CRS, Catholic Relief Services, doesn't do it all. But we enhance, embrace, in, and encompass so many others so that we can offer the best to those that we serve. The concept of partnership and, and Catholic identity bring me back to the issue of solidarity that I was speaking about. A key part of our mission at Catholic Relief Services we now see as building the bonds of solidarity between the American Catholics and the people we serve overseas. Our faith teaches us that we must love our neighbor. In the globalized world of the 21st century, I think all of you can appreciate that our neighbors live in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, in all of those places that 10, 15, 20 years ago you didn't think about. But if you're not thinking about them now, it's kind of irrelevant. Pope Benedict reminds us how central this responsibility is to the life of the church. He, he kind of hit the nail on the head in, in Deus Caritas Est when he said, within the community of believers, there can never be room for a poverty that denies anyone what is needed for a dignified life. And later he says, and I think this is, this is a pretty powerful statement, love for widows and orphans, prisoners, the sick and the needy of every kind is essential to her as the ministry of the sacraments and preaching the gospel. The church cannot neglect the service of charity any more than she can neglect the sacraments and the word. Pope Benedict makes it clear that loving our neighbor, assisting our neighbor, being present with our neighbor in need is not an option. It's not an option for Catholics. Christian charity is not merely another form of philanthropy. Rather, it's rooted in our very spirituality. And I personally do not buy into the debate that, that circulated, and I saw articles coming out of this school, that, oh well, charity versus justice. As I read that encyclical, it's not one or the other, it's both and. And justice is part and parcel of loving of our neighbor. Justice is an integral part of charity. Back in 1971, and I think it was Brian Hare who probably wrote this, the bishops put out a pastoral justice in the world, and they said, Christian love of neighbor and justice cannot be separated. For love implies absolute justice, namely a recognition of the dignity and rights of one's neighbor. And in that spirit of sacrifice and solidarity, as Catholics and Americans, we must increasingly ask ourselves, how does my life, my vote, my consumption, my giving, my prayers affect the lives of the bro our brothers and sisters around the world. At Catholic Relief Services, we have increasingly seen our role as helping American Catholics to ask that question. Do I truly love my neighbor? For that reason, we actually created a whole new division within the organization eight years ago whose sole purpose is to reach out to Catholics in the United States, in universities, in dioceses, and in parishes, individuals, in all kinds of fora, to offer our understanding, our appreciation of who our neighbor is. We help Catholics advocate for their brothers and sisters in the establishment of a big advocacy network. I can't get Sister to go away. I don't think she wants to leave. Uh, we send out these action alerts to people uh, on the web. This piece of legislation you were telling about uh, Carrie Luger today, uh, legislation for foreign aid. I mean, this is what we do now uh, in as profound and as broad a way as we can. 
We suggest ways for people to engage their elected officials. Um, two weeks ago, uh, I was with your senator, Senator Kerry, uh, briefing him on a number of things and trying to get him more engaged in international development issues. That's a new role for Catholic Relief Services. And we help Catholics participate in our mission, yes, by praying for very poor men, women, and children in developing countries, and by basically helping people live a lifestyle that is respectful of our world and the people who live in it. At the core, at our core, the people of Catholic Relief Services see ourselves as an expression of love. We see ourselves as tangible love and an expression of the love of millions of Catholics here in the United States as we have the opportunity to embrace the poorest and most vulnerable people living overseas. And in that way, as your mechanisms, we try to be an instrument of solidarity between our one human family all around the world. It's um, been my pleasure to be back here on campus and sharing with you um, what is embedded profoundly in this institution, in my life, in my family's life, and the life of so many people at CRS. It, uh, in some ways, I, I have to recognize that if I, in fact, am a worthy instrument of this message, it is very much due to the eight years of Jesuit education that I got four years here and four years of BC High. So I thank you for all of that. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight with you.